Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Andrew. And once again, I'd like to welcome you if you are joining us online for the first time today. Today, of course, we are back on our series of the Beatitudes. Perhaps the most important truth propositions in the most important sermon ever preached by Jesus in the Gospels. Before that, let us commit this time to God in prayer. Let us pray together. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our help and our hope for redemption. Amen. In the past weeks, we have heard from Pastor Mark on the first and second beatitude on being poor in spirit and mourning. Last week, we also heard from Pastor Seng Yen on how the meek shall inherit the earth. Today, we will continue with the fourth beatitude, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Before that, however, let's do a quick recap on what is a beatitude. First, beatitudes are not unique to the Sermon on the Mount. Beatitudes can be found in the Old Testament as well. For some Old Testament examples, we can see the following Psalms. The very first Psalm in the very first verse, Psalm 1, 1, Blessed is the man who walks, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor seats in the seat of the scornful. Another Psalm, Psalm 32, verse 1 to 2, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And finally, Psalm 40, verse 4, Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust, and does not respect the proud, nor as such turn aside to lies. The above examples, and even more, from the Old Testament, actually make sense when we read them. Of course, life is good for the man who does not follow bad advice. Sort of stating the obvious, aren't they? Well, the truth is, Beatitudes are more akin to descriptions rather than exhortations. They are more like, life is good when it is nice and sunny, rather than, when it is nice and sunny, life will be good. One is a statement or description, the other is a prescription. In other words, Beatitudes are descriptions and commendations of the good life. Why are they so important? Because it is in these eight statements, Jesus describes what the good life is. This is the good life for anyone who wants to be a disciple of Christ. Case in point, after the Beatitudes are finished, Jesus immediately says, Matthew 5, 13 to 16, starting at verse 13, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine forth before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. The Beatitudes then lay out the description or truth propositions of, on the good Christian life according to Christ. That brings us to our Beatitude today, most aptly brought to us today by me, right? Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. So what is it like to hunger or thirst? I wonder how many of us have experienced genuine deprivation of food and water, the basic necessities of life. By this, I don't mean just feeling hungry after a few days of fasting or feeling thirsty after a particularly intense workout or running the stand chart marathon. These are temporal and in the latter case, self-inflicted. In Singapore, I must confess, it is probably impossible to find someone who is truly starving, much less thirsting to death. Just look at our tap water or even toilet bowl water. It is all potable. This, however, is not the case everywhere or even at every time. In his book, The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, document, he documents what it was like for millions of political prisoners during the time of the Soviet Union in Russia. He recounts seeing his fellow prisoners die slowly and excruciatingly from hunger. The details are very grisly and I won't get into that. 
But Solzhenitsyn goes on to mention how effective hunger was as a tool for the Soviet interrog interrogators. He observed that both, both from personal and recounted experiences, that interrogators could have the most war-hardened veteran, war veteran, one who had been tortured under the Nazis and had suffered all kinds of things. And in just starving this man for a week or even a month, by the end, he would be ready to level false accusations at his mother, his father, his deceased grand grandparents, and even his children for a piece of stale bread. Of course, one does not have to go just to oppressive regimes like the Soviet Union for such examples. We can look to the Bible, or rather, Israel in the wilderness. So first, hungering. In Exodus 16 verses 2 to 3, the text recounts God's provision of manna to the Israelites in the wilderness. The text writes, Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said to him, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by pots of meat and when, and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. The Israelites were not unfamiliar with hunger and the suffering that such a grisly death from, from starvation would bring. Not only that, in the following chapter, there's another example of Israel, this time thirsting in the valley of Rephidim. Exodus 17 verses 1 to 4, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. So, it is common for us to look at the Israelites in the desert as some sort of complain kings. They complain about not having food. They complain about not having water. They complain about the fierce inhabitants of the land. And they complain about the Red Sea and the army pursuing after them. I mean, such trivialities. Perhaps, actually, we project onto them because we as Singaporeans are complaining kings ourselves. The Israelites were all too familiar with what it meant to not have enough to eat during the hardship under Ramesses. They, were, they, especially in the ancient times, were familiar with drought and famine, where a bad year did not mean that you had to eat less expensive food, but rather it likely meant that you would not eat or even drink at all. An example of this can be found in 1 Kings 17, verses 7 to 16, when Elijah went to the widow in Zarephath and asked for bread and water in the midst of the drought. And this is what she said to him in verse 12. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that, where, that we may eat it and die. It is this description of hungering and thirsting that is being presented here in the fourth Beatitude. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness' sake is not something you do in your free time or as non-essential work. It's not meant as a tea time activity or some noble lofty goal up in the sky. The Beatitude is trying to convey to us a sense of desperation to seek and crave righteousness as if our very lives depended on it. This sense of sheer desperation or hunger game continues, communicates to us in what manner we are to pursue righteousness. But what is this righteousness then we are talking about? Well, there are a few ways righteousness can be understood. Righteousness can pertain to one, ourselves, two, others, and three, our society at large. So the first aspect, righteousness as it pertains to ourselves. Have you ever felt betrayed 
or misrepresented? Have you ever placed your trust in someone that you felt was close to you only to have that trust betrayed and in fact turned against you? I know I have. I mean, even me, right? Such a lovable smile and a winning attitude. Well, I guess you can't win them all. At the beginning of this year and throughout last year, we actually learned about someone who was also wrongly, wrongly accused and wrongly persecuted. And his name was David. David, when he was wrongly pursued by King Saul, tried repeatedly to vindicate himself in the eyes of his then king. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 8-10, to it recounts the first time David tried to do this. It says, David also arose afterward, went out of the cave and called to Saul saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed down. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Indeed, David seeks your harm. Look this day, your eyes have seen that the Lord delivered you today into my hand in the cave and someone urged me to kill you. But my eyes spared you and I said, I will not stretch out my hand against my Lord for he is the Lord's anointed. The second time this happened was in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 18 to 20. Verse 18, and he said, Why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? For what have I done or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please, let my Lord the King hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in their inheritance of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. So now do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come up to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Like David, of course, it is natural for us to want to vindicate ourselves in the face of injustice and unfairness. We become hungry and thirsty to defend ourselves in the eyes of those around us, especially when we are wrongly persecuted. But is this righteousness that we are, that righteousness which we are to hunger and thirst for, as mentioned in Matthew 5, 6? The Psalms tell us that the righteousness we are to hunger and thirst for is not the righteousness of justice or self vindication. Instead, we have to pursue the righteousness or just vindication by God for us. Psalm 26, verse 1 to 2, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. In Psalm 35, verses 20 to 21 and 23 to 24, it also writes, verse 20, for they do not speak peace, but they de devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They also open their mouth wide against me and say, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it. Stir up yourself and awaken to my vindication, to my cause, my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness and let them not rejoice over me. And once again, Finally, in Psalm 43, verse 1, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. Even when it comes to ourselves, whether it be our jobs, our character, or even our honour, we are to hunger and thirst, not for our own righteousness, but rather, we are to hunger and thirst for God's vindication of us and for us. This is, of course, where it gets tricky, very tricky, in fact. This might mean that we have to continue serving faithfully while our friends or colleagues continue to tar and feather us with lies. This might mean that we have to continue in faithful love to relatives who have lost the ability to love us back or even appreciate our hard work for them. It may even mean dropping the pursuit and of justice for ourselves and putting even our right to that justice to death. It is no easy thing. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness' sake may seem natural, but whose righteousness are we hungry for? Whose vindication do we seek? Matthew 5, verse 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst 
for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Our hunger and thirst for righteousness, however, is not just a personal affair. When we learn to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness in our lives, this also begins to obligate us to pursue that righteousness of God's justice for others. But what does that look like? Is it the life of activism and hard intervention into organisations outside of the church? I can tell you it certainly isn't exemplified in rioting in the streets and chanting slogans that end with lives matter. Jesus lists one of the imp- one of the aspects of the good Christian life as hungering and thirsting for righteousness because it is not our performative acts that is acts which we perform for others to see of love but our real and personal acts of service that differentiate a disciple of Christ from a disciple of the world. In the Bible, there are numerous examples of pursuing righteousness or hungering and thirsting for the justice of others. One such example can be found in the book of Esther. In Esther chapter 4, we see Mordecai tell Queen Esther of the duty she has to pursue the vindication of her people to the face of her husband, Ahasuerus, king of Persia. Esther chapter 4 verses 13 to 14, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do you think in your heart you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Upon hearing the words of Mordecai, Queen Esther asked for Israel to pray and fast for her, and then she replied, she replied the phrase for which she is most well known for. Esther chapter 4, verse 16, And so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Once again, this was not some superfluous activity which Mordecai was asking Esther to embark embark on. It was not some lobby attempt. It was a serious affair, one that would require her to break the law and would not only mean life or death for the people of Israel, but most immediately for Queen Esther herself. Hungering and thirsting, for the vindication of God in the lives of our neighbours and those we love is not for others to see. More so, it, is om- it almost always will cost us dearly. This sort of hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of others, exemplified by Abraham concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, David at the threshing floor of Aruna, Peter at the temple in the book of Acts, all these acts, of pursuing righteousness for our neighbours was personal, not performative. So what does this look like in our lives? Our names may not be Father Abraham, King David, or even Queen Esther, but but we can hunger and thirst for God's righteousness like them. This, of course, once again, is not the easiest thing. It means taking time out of our busy schedules to sit in the midst of those we desire to see God's righteousness spring forth. This may mean taking hours of your time after a busy and tiring day to sit down with your parents or grandparents to sit with them and show your love to them. It may mean continuing to reach out and pray for those of our friends, colleagues and even children who seem to hate us because we seek their good. It may mean sitting on the floor of a dirty apartment because we wish to see our neighbour come into the righteousness of God. Are we hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God in the hearts of our neighbours? Matthew 5, verse 6, once again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This brings us to our last point on pursuing or hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And that is, we do not pursue righteousness just for our neighbours and for ourselves, but we also pursue God's righteousness or justice in our society. There was once an author named Plato who wrote a discourse on the righteousness or dikaiosune, the Greek word for righteousness, in his book, De Politeia or The Republic. He spoke about justice 
using the analogy of how one rules a city. Plato's view of righteousness concerning God, or the gods, however, was simply fulfilled in the performance of the prescribed duties towards them. By this, he meant that these that the prescribed duties would be performances of, of sacrifices to gods or for the, har- for the harvest and for good weather, as well as the holding of festivals so as to placate their wrath, the gods' wrath, and further enjoin their favour. In Christianity, we call this very simply idol worship. <laughs> or the more academic and pleasing word would be paganism. The righteous duty of the Christian to God here as Jesus preaches it from the Mount of Olives, however, is not located in religious rites and sacrifices. In Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, in fact, the prophet excoriates Israel for this sort of thinking. He says, on behalf of God, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I do not savour your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs, for I will not hear the melodies of your string instruments. But let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Righteousness as it pertains to our community and even our Singaporean society is not found in ritual piety and strict adherence to liturgy. These, when taken as the whole point of the faith of faith in Christ, not on, and not the means to the righteousness which we are seeking, only ends up in superficial placating of our own troubled consciousness and send and sends us onward onto paths of ruin and spiritual destruction. We are then, if we are to live the good life, that good life preached by Jesus Christ, the abundant life spoken of John spoken in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10. We are to hunger and thirst for righteousness in our communities and in our societies as well. Recently in Singapore, we've had a rash of newspaper reports regarding foreign workers. I'm sure we are all familiar with them, especially starting from, especially from the start of this year. From foreign workers effectively de- deported during the circuit breaker, to the disastrous handling of the foreign dormitories leading to an explosion of COVID-19 in our midst to now the injustice of rich employers and their helpers at home. What is our reaction to this? Do we hunger and thirst for God's righteousness in our society, particularly to the alien and the stranger and the foreigner in our midst? In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 17 to 18, God commands the children of Israel saying, You shall not pervert justice due the stranger or the fatherless, nor take a widow's garment as a pledge. But you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, therefore, I command you to do this thing. So how can we pursue the righteousness of God in our society? Well, there have actually been a few shining examples in Singapore. First, Reverend Samuel Gift Stevens. I'm sure most of us know who he is. He is famous around the world because of his ministry of food to the foreign workers housed in the quarantine facilities in Singapore. Another example, Anil Bachandani, who acted as legal counsel for Pati Liani, the, the, the helper who was recently in the, in the, in the, in, in the newspapers. He helped her for three years, pro bono, to finally get her acquitted of the false allegations brought against her. And of course, our own church, Coos and 316. That's right, us, in opening Transit Point as a halfway house for stranded foreign workers, sheltering, feeding, and even clothing the stranger, the foreigner, and the alien. I know some of us are also engaged in this exact pursuit of God's righteousness in our society. Some of us are dedicated to the work of, to working with foreign workers in Little India. Others others of us are engaged with the work to those with special needs or who are differently able in our society. The Family Inclusion Network, for example. And there are really so very, very many more in our church that are doing these great and and wonderful God-given works. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Of course, hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God in our lives, in the lives of others, and in the life of our society was not only preached by Christ with His lips, but more importantly, it was shown through His life, His death and His resurrection. Though Christ, through Christ, God showed that He hungered and thirsted, not just for His own glory and righteousness to rule, but in the loving life and passionate death of Jesus, only Son, our Lord, God showed how He, the Almighty Creator, the One who created all things and from whom all things have their being, how this God hungered and thirsted for us, for us to come into that righteousness. Romans, 31, uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 25 tells us of this hunger and thirst for us. But now, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified or declared righteous freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood, through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, God had passed over the sin that was previously committed. We are all here because God in Christ hungered, thirsted, died and rose again, and th that righteousness would spring forth in your heart and in mine. We are children of redemption, adopted into the family of God's righteous rule. And as we hunger and thirst for righteousness, just as Christ hungered and thirsted for our righteousness, we will be filled. Did you know that the word for filled here, that is chortazo, is a graphic word. It is used also for not only to be filled or satisfied, but it's used also for the fattening of animals and also implies being much more than well filled. This word was also used in Matthew chapter 14, verse 20, at the feeding of the 5,000, where at the end of the day, they had 12 baskets full of fragments. This is why, this is why, you know, I'm most aptly suited to talk about hungering and thirsting because I'm most clearly familiar with being filled. But how can we participate in this that is Christ hungering and thirsting for righteousness? Well, we are actually approaching the flu season in Singapore. That's traditionally during December to February. So I'd like to suggest that we practice a different kind of flu, especially this Christmas. F being for forgiveness, L being for love, and U being for unity. Yes, I know perhaps it's a bit too early to make this sort of jokes, but you know, I'm asking us to give F, L, U, forgiveness, love, and unity to others, especially in this year, 2020. I know even up to now, all, all, all that I've talked about righteousness is actually how we can do, how can we, we can participate in the righteousness of Christ. And not, I have not actually talked about how we can be filled with the righteousness of God. Well, that is actually the miraculous part of our beatitude today. The miraculous part of the beatitude is that as we give others forgiveness, love, and unity, there is, in that moment, a miraculous transaction happening. It, there is a promise, as it were, being fulfilled even in that very moment. Do you know what that is? Well, first, forgiveness. I can tell you from my own experience that when I've sought to forgive others, the forgiveness that, I've, that I had been shown by others and especially by God, I experienced it for myself anew. Is there some terrible hurt, some deep wound that someone you trusted, that you love, has inflicted on you? Do you find it hard to let that injustice go? 
I know I struggle with it terribly. But I tell you sometimes, the promise of God comes fulfilled in the midst of the doing. As we practice forgiveness, we receive it ourselves. It's a miraculous thing, but that's what really happens. And this is exactly what we pray in the, the, the Lord's Prayer when it says, Forgive us our sins just as we are forgiving those who sin against us. Next, love. When I show love to my neighbour, my friend, and even those I am reluctant to show love to, Lord have mercy, I experience the great love of God for me. I experience the grace of God, the love of Christ anew for an unlovable person such as myself. Because I, I realise that the person I'm reluctant to love actually is very much like me. And this experience, this experience of God's love anew, it fills me with so much hope. Is there someone you wish you showed more love to? I remember for myself, those people whom I wish I had more time to show love to. Even now, I may not be able to get back that time, but by merely thinking about it, by remembering that I should have shown more love, for example, to my relative, I'm filled with love, the love of God for me. It is as if there is this wonderful and mysterious treasury of love in heaven. And the only way for that torrent of God's love to flow through our veins is that we would open the taps of our heart and let that river of God's love flow, flow like streams of living water to our neighbours, our friends, and all those we love. And finally, you, unity. When I seek to stand united with my fellow men, to come alongside those suffering in their suffering, I find my life filled, not just with the perfect union of my triune God, but suddenly I find myself in the midst of the laughter and joy of new friendships made and even old friendships renewed. In the practice of Christ's hunger and thirsting for that same righteousness we crave for, we are suddenly filled in our hearts and the world is filled with that love through us. So here is the kicker for our beatitude today. In the living of this life as one hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God, in the very acting out of this life, we not only build up rewards, our rewards in or treasures in heaven, but we experience a glimpse of the fullness of God's very own life in our own lives. By the righteousness we hunger and thirst for in ourselves, for others and for society, and by that righteousness of God, we ourselves become miraculously filled with the glory of God. The hunger and thirsting of the people of God is then not one of suffering. No, it is not some aesthetic journey of detachment and non-attachment, but it's actually the complete opposite. The hungering and thirsting of God's righteousness becomes the very act, the very act of grasping whole the abundant life promised by Jesus Christ, John 10.10, 10, a life full of love and overflowing with grace and hope. Do we hunger for righteousness, for the righteousness of God? Do we thirst for the rule of King Jesus in our lives today? Then let us just give, then let us give forgiveness, love and unity this Christmas season. Because Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. May God fill us up and send us out that the whole world may know and see and praise Christ our King. Amen.